Uh, well, good evening from me, Kaya. Uh, my name is Matthias Lippis and I'm from the Australian Research Data Commons. Thank you very much for coming to our webinar today on uh, the uh, recent report written by More Brains uh, for the Australian Research Data Commons and Australian Access Federation. I would like to start this webinar by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I am, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, um, and uh, pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to extend that respect to all of the First Nations people of Australia uh, and of course any First Nations people in this webinar. Uh, without much further ado, I would actually like to hand over directly to Josh Brain, uh, Josh Brain, uh, Josh Brown, one of the brains of More Brains. Uh, over to you, Josh. Thanks, Matthias. Let me just share my screen. Okay. Well. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, in whatever time zone you are in. It's brilliant to be able to talk to you all today. My name is Josh Brown. Uh, I'm a co-founder of the More Brains Co-op and a research and strategy lead. And I'm going to talk to you today about some of the process and findings of uh, cost-benefit analysis of the adoption of persistent identifiers in the Australian research system. Now, this is based on a study that, uh, that we did previously in the UK as well. Um, which is where we sort of first developed the methodology we used here. Um, and we extended it a bit, and I'll explain how that worked um, as we go through the presentation and talk, tease, try and tease out some of the implications of these findings before we hand over to um, our fabulous panel for more discussion later. So, I mean, the context of this research um, is that there is a huge amount of wasted time and money across the research ecosystem. There is a lot of, a lot of effort uh, a lot of expertise being squandered on administrative tasks. Third, some, some estimates say it could be as much as 40% of the researchers' time is spent on that. In straightened times, this is, this is an unacceptable uh, drain on the, on the funding for research. Now, our study showed that that kind of equates what we can demonstrate for just a limited set of the metadata that people are putting into their administrative systems comes to 38,000 person days a year with an opportunity cost of 24 million Australian dollars a year. So those are the headlines and that's some of the context. So I'd like to talk more about some of this as well, because it's not just that expertise is being squandered, it affects people's ability to understand the research ecosystem. So um, the, the Jason Clare here, the Minister for Education, actually asked the Australian Research Council to investigate ways of making the National Research Assessment Excellence in Research for Australia, and also grant application processes much more efficient. Now, we'll show in the case study later that they've made great strides in this direction already, but I think it kind of just helps to give the context that here for policymakers as well as researchers at every level in the research ecosystem, these costs are mounting up and it's really clouding everyone's ability to assess, uh, to deliver and assess research. Our focus uh, for, the, for the project was on a set of five priority PIDs. Um, these are listed here on the screen. We've got uh, DOIs for grants, ORCIDs for people, RAIDs for projects, uh, RAWs for organisations, and DOIs for outputs, including data, articles, and preprints. Now, all of these have open options. Now, one of the things I'll just say here is this openness, the open metadata being available under a very permissive licence, means that that information that's associated with those PIDs is available, it's accessible, and it's reusable, whether that's in a, someone's proprietary research management system within their institution or within a kind of a, an, an open analytics database that serves the whole community. That reuse is absolutely critical because that's where these benefits come in. So I just want to emphasize the importance of openness to these solutions. Now, in understanding the scale of, of activity, we really did concentrate on the number of entities those PIDs could actually identify in the Australian context. So we used kind of official um, numbers for the number of researchers getting to about 108,000 full-time equivalent researchers active in the Australian, the Australian university sector. And um, we looked at the number of researchers per publication and the amount of time it takes to type in basic factual information, just real simple descriptive things like the title or the citation for an article and so on, um, into, a, into an electronic system. And we used pre-existing research for this rather than reinvent the wheel. So all of these citations on the slides, we will share them afterwards are there if you want to check our, 
check our workings, as it were. Um, to quantify the number of grants and the number of publications, um, we've got um, so uh, we've got the grant coming from a funder, so one award. They reckon this kind of hovers around six thousand a year. We got to this by combining data from the Digital Science Dimensions database uh, with information from the Australian Research Council and the Medical Research Futures Fund. Um, so that's kind of it, it oscillates a bit, but it's roughly steady. And then we have a steadily growing number of publications, which is up to about one hundred eighty thousand a year um, for the last year in which we had reliable data. Um, to identify the number of researchers we have uh, uh, currently active as well with an ORCID to understand the coverage, uh, we went for the number of active records. Now, we've defined an active record as one where someone has logged in or updated their record in the last year. Um, and of those ORCID IDs that have a .au email suffix associated with them, there were 122,000 at the time of writing of the report. Um, we analyzed the number of projects um, as distinct from grants, as someone has observed in the Q&A, um, that uh, to be roughly about 25,000. Now, we did that by using um, the evidence we used from the UK cost benefit analysis to um, assess the number of projects in the UK, and we scaled it according to OEC data about levels of research funding. Now, we talked about the fact that information about grants and publications and so on is being en manually entered into systems. And we recognized that one of the limits in the UK one was we had to assume that each piece of data was only used once. So this is one where we took a step forward um, with the analysis and the, method that we, the methods that we used. And we actually got time to survey Australian institutions and find out how many of them um, are, how, how much time they are repeatedly you know, inputting the same data across the organization. And what we found is that about half of this effort is being put in by researchers who are manually putting this in, and then the other half comes from administrators. So it really is split between professional services and professional researchers here. But grant information is typically entered um, manually, manually entered into a system 3.25 times, and publications, just that basic citation information, is typically entered 3.1 times. Um, previous research cited on previous slides uh, estimates that project descriptive information it can be entered as many as six times. So those are the numbers we used for our analysis. Now, just just to mention the UK study again, we can actually we've just we revisited that study and used these multiplier numbers there to arrive at new figures, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Oops, bear with me. I've just skipped one slide too many. But this is the core analysis. Um, as we said, this is how we got to the 38,000 days and the 24 million Australian dollars. So if we say there are 180,000 publications with four authors, multiply that by 3.1 rekeying events and evidence by, you know, based on work that GIST did in the UK, we estimate that that's about 6.73, it's quite precise for an estimate, uh, minutes of data, of data entry time taken per citation. And that adds up dramatically, as you can see. So following that sequence across all of these for grants, um, average of 10 minutes to enter that information. Same for projects, um, six minutes to six, six rekeying events for projects and so on. You get to these numbers of just under 38,000 and close to $24 million a year. Now, these are that's a significant opportunity cost, but I would just like to say that's with the basic metadata. The key point here is actually there are whole other kinds of benefit that can arrive here because the presence of a PID in a system triggers that pool of metadata which is vital, and that's what saves researchers time and effort, but it could also automate processes. And once we have this kind of level of coverage, there's a whole level of insight, analysis, aggregation of information that becomes possible that enables better strategic planning, enables institutions providing better support for their research portfolio. These kinds of uh, benefits we haven't been able to quantify in this study. So we just like to say, this is, this is, th these, were the, these are the numbers based on just the easiest to, to, to quantify. There are a lot more benefits to be addressed. Um, we also did an analysis about the kind of level of adoption that's required to deliver this. Now, the, one of the key things here is nobody really benefits until everybody benefits. It's a bit like a social network. If you're, most of your friends are not on there, why would you interact with it? Um, these kind of network benefits are really important. The more organizations that are using PIDs and optimizing their workflows to pull in that metadata and reuse it, the more data actually becomes available because more people will be registering identifiers and recording that metadata and the more the benefits build up. So we looked at this and we used um, the, the we, 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 we used the kind of lazy S curve you can see in the in the top left 
And we estimate that, you know, if you get to about 80% levels of coverage um, for the identifiers for these key entities that we talked about earlier, um, you get 90% of the benefits, which I think is kind of, you know, um, it's realistic, it's achievable. Um, I think the, the Australian Orchid Consortium shows that uh, in a five-year period. So we think it's a really important to kind of have that ambitious goal. As I mentioned earlier, we did some case studies to kind of humanize this story and put it, put some of the context in as well. So the first one we talked about was the Australian Research Council. Um, they have an integration in their research application system or their funding application system called RMS that pulls information from ORCID records and pulls information from the Crossref API to populate publication information. Um, and you can kind of see how that process works in the schematic on the top of this slide. But really, I think, you know, they said 78% of the publication data that was, has been submitted since late 2018 when the system went live uh, has come via ORCID. And just those citations have saved the equivalent of 850,000 Australian dollars in research time. Um, and in, you know, but this is not always evenly distributed, of course. So one example from Joe Schapter, who wrote a, a piece for the Australian Access Federation blog on this, said it saved th th that new integration saved him personally three to four days of effort per grant application, which is, as he says there, absolutely staggering. Um, we also uh, spoke to researchers at the Terrestrial Ecosystem Research Network, which is a really complex, very demanding, very highly collaborative research, um, research institution with a real range of sensors, instruments, different kinds of equipment, mu multitudinous projects running simultaneously. And in all of that complexity, the PIDs they already use are delivering significant benefits. And what they're hoping to do is extend their coverage of PIDs, um, bring in more data site DOIs, um, bring in, in international generic sample numbers and so on, so that they can actually have what they're calling a ground truth for the data sets, vocabularies and samples that they use. This is really important in such a complex and diverse research environment as well. So it really speaks to the, to the, to the way that the you know, identifiers and structured metadata and the exchange of these things across systems can actually bring some clarity to a really fast moving, dynamic and complicated um, research process. We also looked at some of the case studies uh, provided by um, Australian Research Data Commons and AAF, Australian Access Federation, who are providing research, uh, uh, research identifier services or access to those services um, to the Australian research sector. Um, ARDC, as you can see here, are providing a number of, of, of those services. AAF is focused on provide, leading the National ORCID Consortium, um, but just that ORCID Consortium alone, um, just in terms of the reducing the cost of ORCID membership and lowering the cost of integrations, has saved close to 4.6 million over five years of its lifespan. And that's before we get on to tabulating the benefits that pulling that data from ORCID records has brought. So, I mean, really significant benefits. And actually, this centralised approach that has, taken in, that has been taken in Australia has really helped to drive down the costs of PID integration and adoption. And that, of course, maximises the available benefits which need to be offset against those costs. So in summary, um, you know, just to repeat that number, that, th that staggering number of 38,000 person days wasted on data entry a year. People, you know, trained researchers, trained professionals supporting researchers who could be using that expertise to do something much more valuable with their time. Um, we also kind of made some recommendations for a strategy uh, in Australia to help to get to that 80% target. Um, so things, you know, we need to build on the leadership that Australians already benefit from in this space with AAF and ARDC. Um, funders need to follow the example of the Australian Research Council and start automating a lot of this kind of the data collection processes that they, they have. And there needs to be a whole sector approach. This needs to be something that supports small institutions, maybe small institutions with a, or large institutions with a very small research footprint who don't have the kind of investment in support services or you know, um, software platforms to provide data about research. It needs to be inclusive and it needs to be comprehensive in order to get to that 80% target. So um, that's my last slide. If you, if you wanna read more about the study, get into the detail of our work, the, the DOI there takes you straight to the record. If you, want, if you have any questions, you wanna stay in touch with me, that's my email address. And we're doing a lot of other work around identifiers, looking at the benefits, um, analyzing the workflows, ways that PIDs can be helpful, metadata exchange can deliver the benefits. So please do take a look at our website for more information about that. Now, I will hand right over to Tash, I think, who's going to talk to us about 
the way that some of these um, some of the findings have been uh, received across Australia. So Natasha, over to you. Great, thank you, Josh. Uh, uh, thanks so much. I don't have any slides, but I'm just going to talk for a few minutes about the response to that uh, report in Australia. So, the first of all, those figures, as Josh mentioned, are staggering, <laughs> and uh, have gained quite a lot of attention from the Australian research environment. We've socialised the report fairly widely, so it has gone to the Deputy Vice Chancellors of Research. They have a committee uh, through Universities Australia that they meet and we presented to that group. Um, we have also done various presentations to our main funders, the Australian Research Council and the National Health and Medical Research Council in Australia and various other presentations. So I think really there's three main responses. I'm going to theme the responses to this. The first one is, wow, those figures are really impressive and people can immediately see how those figures were arrived at. They can see the wastage of freaking something multiple times by multiple people in multiple systems and the way that feeds can help with that. So I think the arguments in the report are very clear. People understand that and that's really, uh, you know, there's no kind of arguments around that. People are like, well, yeah, you can see that. That's very beneficial. Uh, the second response is around the alternative to the excellence in research in Australia exercise, which is our national research assessment exercise, as Josh mentioned, um, the Minister for Education in our government has asked to look at, has asked the Australian Research Council to look at alternatives to the current ERA exercise. And PIDs are, of course, part of looking at that. So the ARC case study is, you know, there's a lot of evidence there that what they've done integrating ORCID into their RMS system has achieved massive gains for researchers and for the ARC in terms of um, saving researchers. I mean, that quote from Professor Joe Schachter that he saves three to four days per grant application because of that integration, that's absolutely massive, especially if you think about um, not just the successful grants, but also the, the grants that weren't successful, but that people spent a lot of time on. So there's a lot of gains to be had there, um, and, and that is demonstrated. So now they're thinking, well, if we've used ORCID for that, what other identifiers could we use to make similar gains and to use it in a reporting exercise? Uh, so, so those things are the top of people's minds. Um, and the other third uh, response is around looking at the gains we have made so far and the infrastructure we have. So we don't have a formal national PID strategy in Australia, we, but we do have a national PID approach. So we have the Australian Orchid Consortium, which as uh, Josh mentioned, has saved 4.5 million. For, what, what was that figure again uh, for the um, Australian Orchid Consortium? It's the middle of the night here and my brain's gone, but it's a lot of million. 4.6. 4.6 million for uh, yeah for Australian research organisations to be part of that. And it's not just the savings. You know, we're talking, this is a PID cost benefit. So the focus is on the costs, but there are, of course, significant benefits from investing in PIDs that are to do with accuracy in reporting and, you know, the persistent identification and of research outputs and objects and linking those to researchers that are all beneficial in a system to make it more uh, trustworthy and to be able to track impact and cite confidently and things like that. Uh, but this report's mostly focused on that cost benefit side. So the next steps for us, I think, are to move from national approach into national uh, PID strategy. And how do we do that? Uh, so the first kind of step that we'd like to make is to, to uh, leverage the interest that we currently have in the report to have a national conversation around this and what uh, might be a useful strategy for Australia. So we need to get together a steering uh, group of people who are or probably at a more senior level who are able to take this forward strategically and probably spawn some working groups from that as well to look at particular aspects of the strategy to move it forward. Um, it's sort of similar to the way us that we built the Australian Orchid Consortium, which was, you know, to get up that demonstrator model. Well, to look at the problem, we start with the problem. What is the common problem that we all have? And are PIDs going to be helpful in solving that? And then what kind of model would be helpful here and float that as a, as a um, 
you know, as a document that people can comment on, you know, have an iterative approach to that, <clears throat> and then have an action plan or a sort of roadmap to take that forward. So we are fortunate that we have the national infrastructure in ARDC to help take that forward as well, and uh, in collaboration with uh, our colleagues at Australian Access Federation. So um, also, the we have also contracted um, Linda O'Brien as our consultant for National PID Strategy. So Linda's on the call tonight, and she is also the chair of the International Orchid Board and has been with the Orchid Consortium. She helped set it up uh, right at the beginning in Australia. Uh, so a really fantastic person to have on board to help uh, lead that discussion forward in Australia. And the last part I wanted to reflect on was uh, some of the potential decisions we might have to make around a national PID strategy. So some of them might be around scope. So, uh, you know, are we gonna focus on the cost benefits, for example, and therefore, uh, you know, are those five priority PIDs the ones we wanna focus on? Um, because there are challenges in some of those PIDs in terms of current adoption levels around RAID, for example, or around RAW, you know, how do we take these things forward? Um, uh, we might have a sort of, we'd like to have kind of a five-year approach, which sounds like a long way off, but that's what we actually did for Orchid and we've achieved that. So I think we need to have the grand vision here. Um, there's also a question around, do we focus on the sort of saving side or the impact side or a bit of both because for example uh, assigning PIDs for research instruments is a big discussion in Australia we have an instruments community of practice there's a lot of interest in that and that's less about the cost benefit because not many people are assigning PIDs and therefore there's not the metadata to reuse around that but it's more about tracking impact it's that big research facilities that are funded by the government in particular want to track the usage of those facilities. And so should that be part of a national PID strategy? And if so, how do we do that? Um, and how do we see the gains from that? And you know, where is that in terms of scope? Where does uh, research start and government stop? Or where is the, what's the role of government data in this? Because government agencies don't tend to see themselves as producing research. However, the things that they produce are used in research. Um, so where does an orchid apply? <clears throat> For example, in a government setting, where does a raw apply in a government setting? What about for organisations that are transitory that are sort of funded for a few years and then go away? Does that fit in the raw framework? You know, where does uh, RAID as a research project identify a fit in government who have different kind of projects that are not around research and things like that. So we've got quite a few questions that I think will come up, but I will uh, leave it there and uh, I will hand over to Alice to open the panel. Thanks, Natasha, and hi, everyone. I apologise, I'm going to mostly have my video off because my internet has been a little iffy and it's probably more stable that way. Um, but great to see everyone. Um, thank you, Josh and Natasha and Matthias for kicking us off. We're now going to get into sort of more of a discussion part of the session. And I'm really delighted that we have representatives here from all five of the priority PID organisations that were mentioned earlier. Um, I am not going to introduce you in great detail, if you don't mind, um, you can add more about your context, but we have Chris um, Shillam and Matt Bass from um, Orchid and Datasite respectively, who are representing the executive director position. We have product managers, Maria Gold and Sean Ross from RAW and ARDC, and then director of partnerships from Crossref, Jennifer Kemp. I want to say a special thank you to Maria and Sean, Natasha and Matthias, who are at the extreme ends of the time zone situation here. Maria's in California and Sean, Natasha and Matthias are in Australia and you're all heroes. Um, so without further ado, we are going to do this. We're going to do a sort of um, each each um, speaker has is going to uh, take an initial stab at one of the questions we've come up with. And then we'll open it up to see if anybody else has anything to add to it. We would really love your questions and your comments as well. So please do put them in the chat or Q&A. We'll do our best to answer them one way or another before the end of the webinar. But if anything is unanswered, we will get back to you afterwards with an answer. So without further ado, Matt is up first. Um, so what are your sort of immediate thoughts on the report and what sort of stands out most to you, both from a kind of data site perspective and, and more broadly, if you want to? Yeah, thanks, Alice. And um, as you mentioned, it, it would be really great to hear from some of the attendees in the chat and also others following on some of their thoughts. 
I think initially, or, or the sort of first impression that I get is, how do we make these figures a reality? And so, you know, I think we, we all look at these and, and go, this is great. Like, this is what we talk about. And this is, you know, the promise that we're making to the community. Um, but it's, how do we make sure that that's a reality, a lived experience for everyone in the community? It definitely resonates quite closely with the approach that we have at DataSide and many of the other, I, I know, you know, our partners around the table today um, ha have an approach where, where we look at building communities of practice and coming together across stakeholders within a community um, with a common common goal and, and common effort. And so I, th I think the report speaks to that and it starts to focus on how do we translate that national pit strategy or how do we um translate that national focus around persistent identifiers and open infrastructure into tangible benefits and, and those benefits being that reuse automation aggregation of information for downstream use cases um i think it also um definitely emphasizes the need for open infrastructures to work together and so everyone you know is sitting around the room today we work very closely with and it's really important because that helps us demonstrate the power of that interoperability and coordination. A lot of these benefits really only come from that interoperability and coordination, but also noting that this is not just a technical solution. It's really, really important that we um, focus our collective effort around what I'll frame as technology and engagement. Um, it's uh, one thing to just make it technically possible, but it's really important that we understand um the work that researchers are doing um their workflows and, and their their um the the key touch points that they they um have in their day to day today and i know this from some of the projects that we're running like the fair workflows project where we really before any pre-registration was done we worked with the research group to identify what are the workflows? What are the steps that you go through that we can support you across the ecosystem? So all of the priority persistent identifiers that are um, included in the report, how do we bring those all together um, to really actually make sure that this is a lived experience for that research group? And then also noting that this is not just uh, about doing it in, in a pilot environment, it's really demonstrating this at scale across across domains, across borders, how do we make sure that that really does scale to bring the benefits and then make sure that these figures are a reality. So those are, I guess, um, yeah, one of the key, um, yeah, some of the key things that stood out to me, interested to hear others' thoughts and, and comments around that. Thanks, Matt. And yes, lots of good points. And I'm guessing that probably everybody around the virtual table would agree with, with what you've said. Does anybody have anything additional to add to that at all? And if not, it's actually, I think, quite a good segue into our next question, uh, which is we, because I think this is going to be um, in many ways critical to achieving um, achieving the, the reality that you uh, that we all want, um, both in Australia and actually in other parts of the world where similar conversations are happening, which is how do all these priority PID organisations currently work together? you know whether it's in terms of messaging or technical developments or whatever and do you see this changing at all in future or how how what 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 can you can, can you give us a sort of sense of how you see that shaping up as um in, i guess particularly in response to this report but also just in general and maria i'll throw that to you first please yeah thanks alice and thanks everyone for being here today so i'm here representing roar and also representing my primary affiliation at the California Digital Library, which is one of the organizations that operates ROAR. And just to pick up a little bit about, um, you know, on what Matt was just talking about, I was, you know, struck by this notion of the report really highlighting the, the, the value and power of, of this framework of thinking about how all of these various PIDs can work together and achieve transformative results. But also the the challenges of, of, of treating them all as a group because they are quite um you know there are some dis important distinctions between them and Natasha was kind of picking up on that a little bit too um you know Roar for example is not 
itself an organization or a standalone service in the way that um, Davis Item, Crossref, and Work It all represent membership organizations. I think there's a lot of power in thinking about how we can connect the dots with these PIDs, but also have to understand some of the nuances between them. And I wanted to answer this question and in particular because I think ROAR is, is really emblematic of of what we can achieve um, with, with the kind of collective action and collaboration across the community that, that the report touches on. So ROAR is an open registry of identifiers for research organizations. It was developed through a collaboration by 17 different organizations and is currently being led by three organizations, California Digital Library, Crossref, and Data Site. And that's a deliberate choice you know in other words we're you know the end goal is not for roar to ultimately become an independent organization but to continue running it as a collaborative effort because uh, ROAR really depends on on wide adoption in crossref metadata in data site metadata it depends on organizations and uh, across academia like california digital library advocating for adoption and use of open identifiers so roar is really a strategic part of what our three organizations are doing and by extension roar also enriches the strategic goals that our three governing organizations have uh, around uh, open metadata and interoperability and uh, community leadership and community investment in infrastructure. So I think we're really emblematic of how organizations can work together to support kind of PID and um, metadata infrastructure that we're talking about in this report. And that's one of the unique values that ROAR provides. And the other thing that I wanted to, to mention is Roar is one of the newer, one of the newer kids on the block, so to speak, and you know, really came into a context in which there was already a really strong framework and fabric for collaboration that really helped Roar got off the ground. I know that data site and Crossref and Orchid already had really strong working relationships. Crossref was very involved in launching Orchid, and Roar has really benefited from the strength of those existing collaborations, both to build networks and also to help drive adoption. So I don't personally see a lot changing uh, substantially in terms of how our organizations already work together, but you know, speaking from the standpoint of ROAR, really trying to insert ourselves uh, in that existing framework and really trying to leverage our collective knowledge and expertise and communities to help drive change. Thank you. And yes, totally agree. Roar is an excellent example of how all these organizations are, are have come together and are already working together. Um, I know we also have quite a lot of um, people from these organizations on the call. So, you know, if you have uh, um, examples of how you're all working together, please do also share them in the chat. I think people would be very interested. Um, but um, Chris, Matt, Sean, Jennifer, if there's anything else you would like to add specifically about uh, things you think that are ways that, ways that you're working together that people would be interested in, now is your chance. I guess I could say uh, just a word or two uh, about that uh, uh, since I've uh, just come uh, a, a couple of weeks ago from uh, meetings with several of the people here in uh, in Europe. Uh, Raid is sort of the new kid on the block uh, as far as these uh, as far as PIDs go. Um, we're uh, definitely benefiting um, from the experience of the longer established uh, PIDs. Uh, they've I've gotten an enormous amount of help uh, with. Um, uh, you know, everything from metadata to sustainability pl to plans and everything in between. Um, and uh, then in a more concrete sense, um, uh, technical integration um, that we are we're looking at um, since, as I'll talk about in a minute, uh, RAID is to a large extent an, uh, a uh, container for other uh, PIDs um, working out. Uh, we've started already discussing how we're going to do that integration um, to uh, uh, ensure data quality that the that something that purports to be an ORCID or uh, a DOI actually is and is the one that you're looking for. Yeah, thanks, Sean. And again, a perfect segue into the question, the next question, which is for you, as you note. Um, and actually, it's come up in the chat as well. So I'm, I'm glad that uh, we have you here to help answer it. So I think, um, you know, it's easy to see why grants and people and organisations and outputs are important in the PID cost benefit analysis. But projects are new as an entity for having a persistent identifier. So could you tell us a little bit more about why they're so important? I mean, I, I think, you know, those of us that have worked on or read the reports um, can absolutely see it. And in fact, I've 
seen a lot of enthusiasm, heard a lot of enthusiasm, but it's not necessarily super obvious um, until you kind of realize what they're trying to do. So if you could explain a bit about that, that would be great. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so I, I guess the way that I like to explain this is that we, we may not all agree on what the definition of a project or research activity is, um, but at least colloquially, um, as uh, as researchers and as research um, administrators, we talk about we talk in terms of projects all the time. Um, and I mean, I'm all, I'm I'm also a researcher in history and archaeology, and even in in has disciplines where um, uh, there are a lot of. Uh, uh, um, uh, single uh, uh, researchers who aren't necessarily working in large collaborations, um, but they still talk in terms of what project they're working on now. Um, so uh, I think there'll be a bit of uh, organic um, definition of, uh, of of what a project is. Um, but uh, as, as far as RAID is concerned, we're really looking at it as the uh, uh, envelope or container uh, for all of the inputs, outputs, organizations, contributors, uh, the, the PID that ties these other things together. And I'll just give sort of three quick um, uh, sort of um, um, examples of how this can, can help. Um, and I think Natasha mentioned this too, that even in these numbers you've got, uh, when we talk about the cost benefit analysis, we if you think about all of the unsuccessful grants, and if you think about the applications, I mean, uh, it, uh, and if you think about the life cycle of a research project, um, at the uh, at, at the at the uh, front end or the direct sort of savings from um, uh, efficiency gains, um, you know, a group of researchers can come together and come up with an idea, get some internal funding front funding from their organizations, and considering the you know sub twenty percent success rates um, uh, for grants like the Australian Research Council grant uh, flagship Australian Research Council grants, um, they may apply for any number of grants before they're successful, um, and. Uh, a RAID offers a source of truth, a place uh, for the information about those projects uh, to be stored that could then be, you know, referenced for the uh, across the half dozen organizations and, you know, uh, 10 or 12 researchers who might be involved in a project to make sure that it's uh, consistent, um, that it doesn't have to be re-entered as, you know, we move from one uh, grant application to another. Um, sometimes there's a little bit of, a, and I think this uh, came up in the uh, in the chat and in the in the Q and A, um, a little bit of conf um, I wouldn't call it confusion, but um, uh, a question about what's the relationship between a project and a grant. And I, I think um, uh, I like uh, something that Natasha said: a, a grant is something you get, and a project is something that you do. Um, and uh, as a as a humanities and social sciences scholar, I can say that, that there's a, a very loose uh, relationship between grants and projects. Many projects function without a grant, and and other projects have multiple grants. Um, so it's um, there. It's not a one to one thing, and um, uh, and and a, a a project idea I think can capture that bigger picture and just very quickly then in reporting and I I saw this recently when I went back and looked at a record um, tied to a grant ID for an old grant that I I won some years ago uh, that said oh this this grant produced three outputs um, whereas now that grant was essentially a seed grant that 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 launched a project that's been going on for twelve for 15 years now and has produced probably a dozen outputs um, and has, you know, now mapped, a, you know, a big swath of uh, heritage in southeastern Europe and had a lot of other impacts that you could capture with a project ID that individual that none of the individual grants on their own uh, would have uh, uh, would have captured. And I think, uh, you know, beyond even just the funding aspect of it, uh, but if you're looking at any of the inputs, um, the organizations, the people, the instruments, anything else, it can really give you the bigger picture of uh, what outputs uh, in the long term are associated with that. Um, and finally, I'd say beyond just the strict, strictly sort of efficiency or rep and and reporting improvements that you might get out of a raid, I think that capturing 
uh, the the history of a project, and that's something we're building into a raid. It's the ability for the raid to evolve over time as people come and go, organizations leave, enter and leave, um, uh, publications come out, etc. It really gives you an important piece of metadata or paradata about the research outputs, the data sets, the publications, the software that can come out uh, of of a project. So, from an open research perspective, I think it's important uh, uh, as as well. So, um, I, I think. I'll leave it there I ramble when I get tired <laughs> no, that, and... <laughs> that, is, that is great Sean thank you so much and I, it always seems to me that the one of one of the wonderful things about RAID is it's this really kind of all embracing this if you can um, register a, a RAID at the very beginning of a project you you get all the benefits from being able to bring all the different metadata in at the start but it can also go on living way beyond the end of a project so you can add all the all the as you say sort of historic information um, as well so uh, pretty pretty amazing thing. Uh, Matt has already mentioned in the chat how data sites are going to be um, starting to use RAID. I don't know if anybody else would like to chip in about how your organisations are planning or thinking about using RAID going forward. Well, to the to the point about um, how we all work together um, at we at Crossref already collect project information in grant records and all talk about this a little bit later, but uh, so obviously we're interested in what RAID is doing and part of the project advisory board. So we're definitely keeping an eye on, on what develops with that. Great. And there's an interesting comment in the chat from Laurie about um, how, how in the US we tend to equate project with grant, which as you say, Laurie, does not acknowledge multiple funding sources, which particularly, I think, well, not maybe not particularly, but certainly in some of the humanities type um, projects is, is, is you know, they tend to get lots of little grants, which are very hard often to keep track of in outputs and things like that. So I, I have heard a lot of enthusiasm from that community about RAID, which is great. So in the interest of time, I'm going to move us on. Um, Jennifer, you're actually up next, uh, and I think you're the perfect person to, to answer this question uh, with your Director of Partnerships hat on. So, you, you know, it it takes a village, doesn't it? We've been talking a little bit about how all your organisations can work together, um, but who else needs to be involved in order to realise the benefits outlined in the report? And again, I think, you know, this is obviously partly a question specifically for Australia, and Natasha, you talked a little bit about this in your comments, but there's also a, obviously a global element. I mean, national, national strategies are great, and we're delighted that, um, that, that, that one is being developed, but PIDs are global, so it is also a sort of global um, initiative as well at, at some level. So, Jennifer, what, what, what do you see as the sort of the, the core constituents who need to be involved to make sure that we are successful? Well, I think, I mean, I think the report covered a lot of this very nicely, but there are a couple of things I want to call out. And for me, from my point of view, I think some of it is definitely a question of scale. So we've talked a lot about funders and funding information. Uh, so registering grants, I think, is a really big piece of this. Um, so funders can register grants with Crossref currently. And to um, an earlier question in the chat and some of the, the notes in the chat about definitions of what can be included, how information, um, how, how PIDs are related, I'm just I'll put a link in the chat. So this gives kind of an overview of what is collected in grant information. And so you'll see some of how um, funding is defined in general, some of the project information that we collect. So, it, it, you know, ORCIDs are part of the information that is collected in grant records. So there's a lot of ways to tie these together already. Um, and we need more of it, basically. So, um, so getting more funders involved, getting more of those grants registered, even sort of older grants are so often important to the related research outputs, because as noted here, it takes time to complete these projects and to publish the output. So, so I think that's that's a very big piece of it. And the other thing that I encounter all the time, one of the groups that I work with at Crossref are service providers. So third parties, the, some of the vendor systems that were mentioned in the report. And one of them that comes up so frequently is the manuscript submission systems, because that is the initial point of capture for so much of this information. And if so, those systems are certainly involved, but as these things develop, as new uh, identifiers emerge, and as the data that surrounds them evolves, because that's really a lot of the, the key to it to me, 
Um, this was called out in the report as well, the metadata reuse. It is the metadata that's associated with the PIDs that is so, so important to all of this. Those systems need to accommodate those new fields. So if there is not a field in one of those systems to collect um, a grant DOI or a RAID or whatever the case may be, then it really interrupts kind of the metadata supply chain. So I think we've got the right uh, communities involved for the most part, but, but maybe the participation needs to kind of scale up a little bit or just adapt as things move along a little bit more quickly. That's it. Any other comments? Are there, are there any sort of groups or organizations that people feel really should be brought in who perhaps aren't participating as much as they should be at the moment? The, the one other thing I might add is just um, in libraries in general. So, uh, you know, the, the RIM and CRIS systems have come up in the report, of course, but there's so much really rich information out there. And, you know, in the sort of traditional library systems, mark records and things like that just don't accommodate a lot of this information in a lot of cases, which I think is, is a little bit unfortunate. And I hope that that changes a bit over time. I mean, I think from my perspective, one of the possible challenges is, and you slightly alluded to that just then, Jennifer, is, is getting um, the service providers and vendors on board because um, none of this is going to work if we don't have systems interoperability. People, if the, if the people building systems don't actually build PIDs into them. And I think, you know, there's clearly some great success stories there, but I think we've still got quite a long way to go. So finding ways to bring those people into the and organizations into the conversation and really make sure that they're <laughs> that's a float, floating thumbs up coming from somebody um uh make, making sure that they're uh, brought into the conversation and really brought into the idea of making this a reality seems to me to be a really important thing as well so perhaps something to to think about going forward so sorry, we we are we, we knew this was going to be a, a good, interesting, long discussion. So I'm going to move us on again. And Chris, as you know, you are up uh, last, please. Uh, and I think this is a nice sort of wrap up that will segue into perhaps Josh is going to just very summarise very quickly right at the end. But what do you see as the concrete next steps on this? How can we actually make this a reality? What will that look like um, both at Orchid and sort of more generally? Sure. Well, hi, everybody. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Nice to be here. Um, you know, I think um, picking up on something that um, was clearly stated in, in the report, and I think Josh mentioned it in his talk earlier, um, the, the question really is, you know, given that this is a collective action problem, um, how do we move it forward? And, and it's pretty hard to move forward um, on all fronts at once, I think. Um, so, you know, I think that, that one of the important um, things to think about here, and, and that's something we're doing at ORCID, but I'd also advise anybody in their own community to think about this, is what's the thing to do next? Not, you know, not trying to do everything at once. And I think the things to do next are the things that are going to have the most impact for the most people. So I think a really good example um, from one of the case studies in the report is the integration of ORCID into the um, into the ARC grant application process, because I'm assuming Australia, that's a system that's used by lots of people, so it's broadly applicable, um, and those kinds of processes tend to be um, quite high stakes, right? People are highly motivated in, in, in getting grants, as they are with funding, um, so having a really good um, integration with PIDs in that system is going to, to to drive impact and it's also then serving as a case study to see look at the benefits that can be achieved from this kind of integration so in in the case of ORCID one of the things we're looking at and this picks up on something you said earlier Jennifer as well is that we're really looking at the service providers that have ORCID integrated into their systems and we'll be we have a, a certified service provider program that we'll be launching next relaunching next year um, and we really want to encourage and motivate service providers to have better deeper um, integrations with ORCID because you know if we get a better integration in the service provider that's used by a thousand institutions that's going to have much more impact than one integration at one institution 
Um, so I'd encourage everybody in their community to think about what are the most impactful processes, workflows um, that we can really focus our attention on, um, because I think you get further by making those important steps than trying to take thousands of tiny steps. And I think the, the other aspect of that is incentivization um, and figuring out what are the incentives for every actor in the system um, to move in the direction of adopting PIDs. We, we live in a fairly complex multi-stakeholder world. We've already talked about um, uh, researchers, and research institutions and funders, um, there are vendors, there are publishers. Everybody's got to get something out of this because everybody has their own priorities and everybody's got to be incentivized to um, um, to participate. So I thought another, you know, referencing that um, that um, case study in the in the report again of the ARC implementation, there's huge um, incentive for researchers to participate and use that integration because they save a bunch of time and hassle, right? Um, and they also then are delighted by it. it would seem from the anecdote from Professor Chapter that it's unbelievable this 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 integration has made his life much better or it seems unbelievable it seems like magic and I think we we want to kind of create those incentives um, for people to um, actually participate because researchers let's face it they want to do research right they don't want to do administration and anything that kind of gets out of their way um, and makes it easier for them is going to be positively re re received. So I often see, you know, in our case, Chris, you just put yourself on mute. Don't know how that happened. I often see orchid integrations, which um, are just um, collecting orchids and doing nothing with them, right? And that's just an extra step for researchers that doesn't help anybody. So if you're going to do an integration, think about how you're going to use whatever PID it is and how you're actually going to give some benefits back to the person you're asking to do something, because, again, that will create kind of positive momentum. Automation is a big part there. Defaults are a big part there. So last thing I'll say is I encourage everybody to think about um, um, minimizing button presses. Orchid, we're all about researcher control, right? We want to give everybody the control about how their data is used. But increasingly, we want to make sure that the thing that most people probably want um, and is most useful for most people happens by default. And then they can go and change the settings that they want to, to make something different happen. And again, I see a lot of integrations that still have a lot of button pressing involved. You know, if you're going to, um, if you're going to have the possibility of automating a workflow, turn it on by default and let people turn it off if they want to, right? Don't make them press an extra button to turn it on because there's a good chance they'll never find that button or they won't know what it is until they see the benefit of it. So let me stop there, but I'd say it's kind of um, sequencing, figuring out what you do first and um, what you do next. Impact, making sure there's something in it for uh, everybody who you're asking to do something um, and automation um, so that people have to do less. Um, to get what you'd like them to get out of the system. Thanks, Chris. I'm pretty sure cheers all round for all those all those suggestions. Um, <clears throat> we are about to wrap up. Does anybody have anything to add into what Chris said um, before I hand over to Josh to wrap things up for us? Go for it, Josh. And thank you very much, everyone. This has been a really, really interesting conversation. I appreciate it. Thanks, Alice. And yeah, thank you to everyone on the panel for your thoughts. It's been a really insightful and, um, I dare I say, slightly inspirational conversation. I think there's a lot coming out of this. I mean, I, in, our, in, our, in our work, we focused on the benefits within institutions and we focused on the time that could be saved by metadata, automated metadata reuse. Um, this, as I said in my presentation, it skips over a lot of the potential benefits here. And actually, I think what we need to think about is PIDs as a bridge between these systems, whether they're open or closed, whether they're institutional or publishing, um, where they, wherever you are in the research lifecycle. These connections between PIDs, we talked about how you could attach a RAID to a, to a grant identifier. Well, what if as RAID picks up adoption, it was able, you were able to also update the grant ID as a, a, an investigator is hired six months into the life cycle of a project that could go back to the grant ID. And when somebody signs in with their ORCID in their publishing process uh, to give their ORCID ID, they're published, you, 
the publisher system looks in our ORCID record, pulls up that grant ID and says, oh, you've worked with these people. And is this the correct grant? And then it automates the grant acknowledgement and it picks up the raw from their ORCID record and uh, automatically populates their affiliation and saves them time. And within the publisher, they're able to look at the RAID and the grant and their previous publications and identify potential conflicts of interest and streamline the process of organizing peer review. There's a whole realm of ways that working across communities, and I think this speaks to Chris's comment about aligning incentives. There are costs at every stage. And sometimes if a publisher doesn't pick up a piece of institution, a piece of data, it's an institution or a funder who has to pay the price of, re of replicating that information or filling that gap. But often that the real burden of that ends up falling on the researchers. So I think one of the things we've really covered today is that if we're all working together, there's a lot we could do to bring down the cost and the complexity of PID integration, but there's also a lot we can do to really accelerate the value and deliver the value of these PIDs. And it goes a long way beyond time or money savings. And I think if we can keep keep a kind of shared focus on that shared goal, and as you know, be pragmatic, look at improving our own systems, look at building up adoption, but also look at those key integrations where that value is going to be delivered and think about how we incentivize other communities who, who, who our researchers depend on to actually develop PIDs, implement PIDs and do it well and do it effectively and do it soon. I think we've got a real, a real case to be made here. And I look forward to seeing how our colleagues on the call from the various PID providers and the community representatives joining us today work together to drive this forward nationally and internationally, as well as in the lab or in the library or the archive. So thanks.